You're not supposed to be awake. <laughs> Sorry, baby. Did I wake you up? No. Okay. Yeah. Mm, I went out to the kitchen to get a snack. <laughs> and I ate an orange. Do you, do you want something? I can go grab you a snack. Okay. Well, let me know if that changes. <laughs> Scoot over. How did you roll all the way to my side of the bed in the last ten minutes? <laughs> Come on, let me back in, Bubba. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> no, um, I don't know why I'm awake. And I wasn't even that hungry. It was just that I thought that getting up and doing something would maybe make me feel more tired, but I guess not. <sighs> what about you, my love? Why are you awake? Mm. Were you up before I got up? Oh, I could have said something. No, it's okay. <clears throat> Come here. The good thing about waking up in the middle of the night is that we can uh, re-cuddle. Because <laughs> we tend to both kind of starfish out in the middle of the night. Come here. <laughs> well, you look tired. <laughs> oh, you're so sleepy. You're cuddly. You just can't fall asleep. Yeah, I got you. It's okay. <laughs> I don't mind having a late night with you. Hmm. I could, but I feel like you might feel better if <laughs> if I don't tell you what time it is right now. Yeah, well, I'll keep your phone over here. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't want you to be stressed about being awake. Just relax and you go to sleep when you're supposed to go to sleep. You'll be okay. <laughs> and I'll be okay too. We'll be okay together. Mm. What do you think about on the nights when there's too many thoughts to go to sleep? What kind of things are going through your head? Mm. Mm hmm. No, it's it's similar for me. Some nights I'm having a, a bad night and thinking about all the things that went wrong that day and all the different ways I could have acted and really micromanaging things, you know. The, I could have said this in a different way, in a better way, or I could have, I don't know, done X, Y, and Z to make this person feel... A different way. And sometimes it's thinking about a million things from the past and things I obviously can't fix or improve, but they, they stick in my head. But some nights it's not all bad things. Sometimes I'm just really about, really excited about what we're doing the next day. Sometimes it's hard for me to sleep, like if I have plans for you in the morning. Like some, you know, the mornings where I wake up and I cook you something, it makes it hard to sleep because I'm so excited to do it. <laughs> yeah. Or, I don't know. Sometimes I get restless. But you do too. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we always make it work. And I really appreciate the nights where you wake me up when you're having a rough night. 
Yeah, I mean, I you know how much I hate being woken up. <laughs> I'm awful in the mornings, but something about those dark, quiet nights with you and just helping you go back to sleep, it makes me feel, um, it makes me feel good. I like being with you and being able to help you in those moments, you know. <laughs> what? I appreciate that you like listening me, to me talk. Um, do you want me to <laughs> just keep talking and ramble until you fall asleep? Are you sure? There's there's nothing you want to talk about. There's nothing that um, nothing you need to get out before you'll be able to sleep. <laughs> okay. Mm. Mm. I love you so much. Thank you for living with me and loving me and letting me love you. I was reading something earlier, it was about, you know, everybody's finding out what their love languages are nowadays, and it was something about loving your partner in their love language, and I thought that was really special, because I feel like we try to do that. You know, it's not, it's not a self-centered form of love. You don't do things expecting them back, and the way we love each other is the way that we know the other person wants to be loved, not the way that we want to be loved, you know? <laughs> no. Not all of my late-night thoughts are romantic and somewhat philosophical. <laughs> I think a lot about fun facts that I've learned. Uh, like earlier today, I was looking at one of those charts that shows how some of the most beige, wow, basic, how some of the most basic forms of citrus fruits were combined to create the ones we know today. Like I didn't know that lemons and oranges and all that, you know, they're crossbreeds. Um, and going down this rabbit hole of citrus fruit crossbreeds, I started reading about red grapefruit and how that's well, it's not created in a gamma garden, but it was originally made in a gamma garden. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know what one was either. How about, um, <laughs> well, firstly, are, are you comfortable? Are you ready to sleep? Good, because I can pull up the Wikipedia article on what atomic gardening is, if you'd like to hear about that to fall asleep to. I think it's really interesting, but I won't be offended if you fall asleep while I'm reading about atomic gardening. <laughs> okay. All right, you get comfortable, baby. Let me see. I feel like I bookmarked it because I was going to show you... Um, look okay oh here it is this is it's kind of short but it's on atomic gardening so atomic gardening is a form of mutation breeding where plants are exposed to radiation some of the mutations produced thereby have turned out to be useful typically this is gamma radiation in which case it is a gamma garden produced by cobalt 60 that's what i was reading about earlier they use cobalt 60 or used cobalt-60 to make red grapefruits. The practice of plant irradiation has resulted in the development of over 2,000 new varieties of plants, most of which are now used in agriculture production. One example is the resistance to uh, verticillium wilt of the Todd's, the Todd's Mitchum cultivar of peppermint, which was produced from a breeding and test program at Brookhaven National Laboratory from the mid-1950s. Additionally, the Rio Star Grapefruit, developed at the Texas A&M Citrus Center in the 1970s, 
now accounts for over three quarters of the grapefruit produced in Texas. So that's what I was reading about earlier. Uh, let's go to the history section. Beginning in the 1950s, Atomic Gardens were a part of Atoms for Peace, a program to develop peaceful uses of fission energy after World War II. Gamma Gardens were established in laboratories in the United States, Europe, the Soviet Union, India, and Japan. Though these gardens were initially designed with the aim of testing the effects of radiation on plant life, research gradually turned towards using radiation to introduce beneficial mutations that could give plants useful characteristics. Such characteristics included increased resilience to adverse weather or a faster growth rate. In addition, the Atomic Gardening Society was established in 1959 by Muriel Howarth an atomic activist from the United Kingdom in conjunction with a growing movement to bring atomic energy and experimentation into the lives of ordinary citizens. In 1960, Howarth published a book entitled Atomic Gardening for the Layman, along a similar theme. The Atomic Gardening Society utilized an early form of crowdsourcing in which members received irradiated seeds, irradiated seeds? Irradiated seeds, maybe planted them in their gardens, and sent reports back to Howarth detailing the results. Howarth herself made national news upon growing a two-foot-tall peanut plant after planting an irradiated nut. The youngest member of the society was Christopher Abbey, 15, a student at Eastburn College and the son of a dentist who received a certificate of merit for propagating several species of irradiated seeds to maturity. Irradiated seeds were sold to the public by C.J. Spees, a Tennessee dentist who had obtained a license for a Cobalt-60 source. How do you obtain a license for a Cobalt-60 source? I would love to know that. And sold seeds produced in a backyard cinder block bunker. Seeds did, seeds did so upon seeing an opportunity. Oh, Spees. Spees did so upon seeing an opportunity for amateur gardeners to get involved in testing. Howarth, in an effect to give the members of her society a broader selection, began ordering seeds from Spees in large quantities. By 1960, Spees had reportedly shipped Howarth over 3.5 million seeds, which were then distributed to nearly 1,000 individual society members. Despite the initial enthusiasm, the Atomic Gardening Society declined by the mid-1960s. This was due to a combination of public opinion moving away from atomic energy and a failure on the part of the crowdsource society to produce noteworthy results. In spite of this, large-scale gamma gardens remained in use, and a number of commercial plant varieties were developed and released by laboratories and private companies alike. That's the history section. <laughs> Let's see what they have. <laughs> oh, my sleepy baby. Okay, you can you could do with one more paragraph. Okay, methodology. Gamma gardens were typically five acres in size and were five acres in size and were arranged in a circular pattern with a retractable radiation source in the middle. Plants were usually laid out like slices of a pie, stemming from the radiation, the central radiation source. This pattern produced a large range of radiation doses over the radius from the center. Radioactive bombardment would take place for around 20 hours, after which scientists wearing protective equipment would enter the garden and assess the results. The plants, the plants nearest the center usually died, while the ones further out often featured, quote, tumors and other growth abnormalities, quote. Beyond these were the plants of interest, with a higher than usual range of mutations, though not to the damaging extent of those closer to the radiation source. These gamma gardens have continued to operate on largely the same designs as those conceived in the 1950s. Research into the potential benefits of atomic gardening has continued, most notably through a joint operation between the International Atomic Energy Agency and the UN's Food and Agriculture, op op the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. Japan's Institute of Radiation Breeding is well known for its modern-day usage of atomic gardening techniques. The popularity of atomic gardening coincided with a post-war society 
seeking to put newly discovered atomic energy to use. Many scientists and members of the public believe that atomic energy could be harnessed to address a great number of worldwide issues, including famine and energy shortages, leading them to embrace the new atomic era. Some scientists that had worked on the military application of atomic energy in the past invested in or sponsored programs dedicated to bringing more peaceful applications of atomic energy to the public domain. And this included atomic gardening. As public skepticism of atomic energy grew, and as nuclear arsenals continued to increase in their size across the globe, atomic gardening fell out of favor along with, along with other atoms for peace initiatives. And that's all they have on Wikipedia. There's a link to the effect of gamma rays on man in the moon marigolds. Apparently that's a play. It's a play written by Paul Zindel, a playwright and science teacher. That sounds like an interesting plot for um, a play, and I wonder if it actually has to do with radiation breeding. Ooh, it also links to Atomic Gardening and Online History, which is a comprehensive outline of atomic gardening by Dr. Paige Johnson. Oh, we'll have to look through that. <laughs> but that can be something for another night. <sighs> Hopefully I can sleep after learning all this new information. <laughs> Are you asleep, baby? <laughs> of course you are. Normally I'd be offended that someone would fall asleep while I'm talking about something I care about, but I guess I'll let it slide for you. <laughs> mm. Okay. Sleep tight, baby. I love you. <laughs>